Hello, welcome to part two of my message for this week, Out of Context. In part one, we looked at and we read the passage that we saw out of context, verses one through six, and we're studying Genesis uh, 11, verses one through nine. But if you read in Genesis 11, verses one through six, you get a very different tone, a very different mood than in Genesis 11, verses seven through nine. So if you only take Genesis 11, 1 through 6 out of context, then you don't understand the meaning and the reason behind what God says in Genesis 11, 7 through 9. So now we're going to start to explore this out of concept, or out of context, uh, to explain the reasoning behind why God did what he did, even though it doesn't make sense in the human mind and in the human eyes. Uh, so if we go back, let's go back to the top, let's go back to verse 1, and let's try and break down the context. Now, when I was studying this, I first read it in the NIV, um, which is what I have here, the New International Version. But then I also went back and read a few different translations, uh, and one of them that I have is the King James Version. Now, the King James Version... Uh, calls verses 1 through 4 the destruction of man. Which is interesting because when I read it in the NIV, passage, the whole entire passage, verses 1 through 9, are all called the Tower of Babel. But in the King James Version, there's two different sections. There's verses 1 through 4 and then 5 through 9. Verses 1 through 4 being the destruction of man, verses 5 through 9 being the confusion of the language. So it's interesting how the King James Version also almost goes in and tackles different topics than the NIV does. So let's look at maybe some of the reasons behind why this was the destruction of man. So let's read, starting in verse 1, it says, now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. Now, if you take this out of context, you won't realize that there's anything wrong within these first two verses. But let me tell you, they've already made a detrimental mistake to what they're doing. If you go back to verse 2, it says, as men moved eastward. As men, out of man's will, out of man's will, out of our will. They moved eastward. Out of our will, out of my will, I'm going to move myself. That's what, that's what these people were saying. The way that God works is not by you, but through you. So God doesn't say, oh, where you go, I go. No, God says, where I go, you follow. Where I go is where I call you to go. God doesn't want you moving until he's called you to move. Sometimes you're so worried about getting out of the situation that you're in, you think that if you get out of the situation that you're in right now, if you get out underneath the power of your own will, that it will be solved. But let me tell you, it's not going to get solved until God says move. Sometimes what you're going through right now is only building you up for the next season in your life. Sometimes the things that you're going through right now excuse me, right now, are the things that are preparing you to do bigger and greater things. And you can't get that experience if you move by your own will. This is detrimental. Detrimental. Verse 2 is detrimental. But you wouldn't notice it if you take it out of context. We didn't notice it in the first time through. Because remember, the Shinar, the plain of Shinar, the place where they're going, is a place that's very fertile. It's a place that looks appealing. It's the place where they think they need to go in order to be successful. But God says it's not where you think you need to go, it's where I call you to go. Verse 3 says, They said to each other, Come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Now the second half of this is what's really important. It says they use brick for stone. Now let's look at brick and stone really quick. What is brick? Brick is nice, squared off, kind of like this book, right? It, it's very consistent. These books, this book that I got right here, uh, I got when I was in church after I went through 
um, second grade confirmation, second grade Bible study uh, in the church. And this is what we got at the end. Uh, and it's kind of like your graduation into regular church. So that's when you would stop going to children's school, children's church, and you would go to regular church. And so they gave you this Bible as a reminder of what you went through. So this book is something that stayed very consistent. The only thing that changed, actually, was the inscription of the name on the book. That's the only thing that changed. Bricks are very consistent. When you build with them, you know what you're going to get. And with stone, you work with what you find. But brick is much weaker than stone. In fact, you can look at martial artists, right? If you have a very well-trained uh, martial artist or somebody who studies karate or taekwondo or anything like that, they're able to break brick. Now, this is insane. If I ever tried to break brick, I would break my hand or whatever part I'm hitting it with. But these people can break brick. However, I've never seen anybody break stone or even attempt to break stone because it's not going to work. Stone isn't something that you break. But brick is man-made. And stone is naturally made, made by God. God created the stone. God did not create the brick. Man created the brick. So just because it's something that you have, just because it's something that you can make, and it's more consistent, and sometimes it's easier to build with something that's consistent instead of working with what is provided for you, it's not as strong, it's not as stable. It's not as lasting as stone. Now the second part, it says tar for mortar. They use tar for mortar. Now if you read more ancient texts of the translation, and just more ancient meaning uh, texts that were before the NIV. So if you go back to the King James Version, which is the first translation into English, so therefore it should be the most uh, relevant, the most accurate, should be. I'm not saying it is, but it should be, since it's the oldest one. The King James Version, it says, and they used slime. For mortar. Now this slime, this tar, it's speaking of the same thing. And in the Shinar Valley, if we read in Genesis 14.10, it's actually something that is in abundance. In verse 14.10, it says, Now the valley of Siddim, the valley of Siddim is part of the plain of Shinar, uh, which these people had settled in. Now the valley of Siddim, was full of tar pits, was full of these slime pits. They were everywhere. And now the rest of the verse isn't really important to what I'm trying to get at. Um, so just that first part. Now the valley of Siddim was full of these tar pits. And these tar pits were easily accessible. But mortar, right, which is what was commonly used, is not something that is natural. Right? It's made by human. So now, instead of spending their time making mortar, which if you use stone and mortar, you're going to get a very structured, very uh, strong house. God says, don't worry about the stone. I'll provide the stone, but you still have to do a little bit of work. So provide the mortar. Right? Right? But now these people say, no, we're going to step in the place of God and we're going to supply the thing that God had provided for us and we're going to change it a little bit, make it a little bit easier for ourselves. And instead, we're going to use slime. We're going to use what's available in order to build our house. Now this isn't good, because the time that they spent making the bricks, and the reason why they had to make bricks is because the plain of Shinar didn't have any bricks. There were no, or didn't have any stones, sorry. There were no stones for them to go out and find and use. So if we look at that, the Shinar is a very fertile place. It's a place that's very attractive. It's a place that where people would want to live. 
But guess what? Sometimes the fertile places in your life are not the places where you need to be building. The fertile places, the places where you can grow and grow and grow and see production and see yield is not the places where you need to be building. And when we go to this building, if we're dealing with the bricks, if we're dealing with the man-made, and we just stack a whole lot of bricks on top of each other, they can be easily knocked down. If they just, if somebody, anybody, just stacked up a few bricks on top of each other, I can just knock it down. All it takes is a slight gust of wind, a nice little breeze, and then those bricks are going down. Right? But if you have something to hold it together, if you have something to hold it together, then the bricks won't come apart. Now, this is important because all of our lives, people are telling themselves, I need to build myself up. People have told them, you need to build yourself up. You need to build yourself up. You need to build up what's around you. You need to get an education so you can build up the level of job you can get. You need to work in your job. You need to build up where you're at in your job so you can get paid more. And in order for you to get paid more, that means that you can provide better for your family. You need to build up the situation where you're in now. You need to build up, build up, build up. And so many people are worried about building that they aren't worried about holding it together. They aren't worried about taking the bricks and keeping them together, taking the bricks and stacking them is their only concern. They're only worried about stacking up. They aren't worried about holding them together. And if you have a life that is built but not held together, it's not going to work. As soon as a storm comes and you're living in a house that is built up but not together, that house is going to fall down. And it's going to fall down on top of you. You need to take time to build not only up, but build together. Okay? Now, this slime that they were using, even though it was abundance, even though it was in abundance, it was everywhere in the field, in the plain, it was very inconsistent. Very inconsistent. This slime, about half of the time, would harden like it's supposed to, but the other half of the time, it wouldn't hold. It would kind of just be there. You could like leave an imprint if you were just to lightly touch it. And then that imprint would stay there. It would never dry. So what does that mean? If you spend all your time into building up your life, if you spend all your time thinking about how am I going to build up my life, and you don't spend any time thinking how do I hold it together, and then all you use is what's around you in order to hold it together, then guess what? It's not going to work over half the time. And I don't want to take those chances because if I'm living in a house and I'm depending on this house to keep me safe, if I'm depending on God to keep me safe and God has provided me with this house and he said, okay, this is the way that you're going to make it so that when the storm comes and the rain comes and the heavy wind comes, that it's not going to fall down. The, the slime isn't going to run away because I'm not using slime. I'm using mortar. I'm using mortar. I'm using stone. I'm not using brick. I'm not worried about the things, the man-made things that I can use to build up. I'm, I'm going to let God build me up. I need to worry about keeping it together by holding myself in his word, by using the mortar that he has provided for me in the Bible. You're using the mortar that has allowed him to see, allow me to see what he has done for me. That's important. Because if you try and flip it around, if you try and put yourself in the place of the builder, then your house is going to fall down because while you're spending so much time into the bricks and God's telling you to spend so much time on the mortar, then once the storm comes, the thing that's holding your life together is just going to wash away. It's going to wash away. They settled for less. They used man in place of God and they settled for less. Verse 4 said, so then, then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered 
over the face of the whole earth. Now I'm going to read this again, and I'm going to try and emphasize some stuff in this passage, in this verse right here, and I want you to try and pick up the type of language, the type of meaning that they're trying to portray behind this. You ready? It says, they said, come let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the we, us, ourselves, that's all that they have in mind. That's all that they have in mind. And God is saying, stop worrying about yourself. You want to build a city to make a name for yourself, and all you're doing is putting more work on yourself. Sometimes the place where you're at right now, the things that you're going through right now, you put on yourself. God didn't tell you to go there. You walked there. You went there. You moved there because you thought that it would be better. But then once you got there, you realized that just because it's fertile ground doesn't mean that it's a good place for building. But guess what? I'm going to build anyway because I'm more concerned about the agriculture. I'm more concerned about growing than I am building. And God says, guess what? You put this on yourself. It's all about you. It's all about what you think is needed for yourself. And that's not what God does. This is destructive. This is why the KJV calls it the destruction of man. They're so worried about themselves. They're so worried about going through the situation their way, that they don't depend on his way, which is the important way. Now in the next section, we're going to look at the confusion of the language in part three. I hope to see you back.